This week's guest is pop punk royalty, the voice of Chuck E. Cheese, and does about three or four different podcasts and about three or four different bands. He's such a busy guy, so I appreciate his time so much. Uh, Jarrett Reddick, the lead singer of Bone for Soup, of course, as well as he does so much. Like honestly, the different bands, the different uh, bonefoursoup.com. He says at the end of the video is the best place to go and uh, look up what he's doing and what he's up to or Jarrett2113 on Instagram and uh, you can look me up if you're on Instagram as well which is uh, at gingerbeardmark or at gingerbeardmark on Twitter uh, get my little plugs in there as well but yeah I was so lucky to speak to Jarrett he's such a nice guy, he's really kind and uh, a few months ago he'd stopped doing podcast appearances and stuff but very graciously said that he would do uh, an interview with me which I'm ever so grateful for uh, so yeah go and check this out and if you're in the UK go and see him on his acoustic tour with Rob from Bowling for Soup or next April he's on tour with a whole of Bowling for Soup uh, throughout the UK so go and check either one of those out if you're in the UK they're definitely worth your time so here we go uh, guest for this week the awesome Mr Jarrett Reddick from Bowling for Soup it's great to be here and how are you man yeah i'm, I'm okay i'm you know as as well as anyone can be at the, at the minute but yeah I'm, sure. I'm doing all right what about you man i'm doing great you know um you know we're we're getting back to work slowly but surely um you know my my family's happy and healthy which is all i could really ask for uh and so yeah man i'm doing good it's uh, you're clearly very busy and very popular at the minute. <laughs> oh man, no, it's uh, it's all good, man. I uh, you know I I appreciate you setting this up. Yeah, I, yeah. you know it's funny because it's like a year and a half ago, I'm sitting there and COVID hits, and you know it was like, man, I don't have anything to do, you know, and I I had to find my own ways to be productive, and so you know just basically started saying yes to anybody that wanted to talk to me. So. Uh, I, I actually, so then here's an, a, a, a good, uh, this is a good compliment to you. Okay. I actually stopped saying yes to everybody a few months ago because it started to get crazy. So uh, that's how much I appreciate you asking me to be here. Oh, thank you very much, man. That, that is a big compliment. Because um, I, I mentioned in my first email to you, like I saw you guys back for the first time back in 2002 okay as a support band for for an english band for sponge yeah, yeah who are back sponge. by the way that sponge back to back doing festivals this summer yeah yeah um and uh i, I remember because my, my brother had got backstage passes for sponge and so he disappeared off you know thinking he was hot shit going backstage while yeah. we all stood there and watched you guys and so he came out and was like hey i've just been backstage with sponge we're like We've just seen this amazing American <laughs> band, and you, it was like you were you were sort of premiering the girl all the bad guys want video at the time. We're like they had this hilarious video, and yeah. he, suddenly he was the one that was like, "Oh, maybe I missed it." <laughs> yeah, that was um, yeah. It's funny, you know, that particular tour. Um, we we got there about the time the girl the bad guys want video was coming out. And by the time we left that tour, it was massive. And so like we, we were actually in the country and felt it all happen, you know, and, and yeah. it was, and even the sponge guys were just like, you know, there's a, there's a bit of a shift in the first shows and the way that people reacted to us and then how they were reacting to us by the end of it all. Um, you know, they, it, it was, it was very visible um, and audible, but uh, yeah, I mean, it was, uh, that was a crazy time. You know, and it was kind of from there, you know, that that was we that's the only tour we ever supported anybody else in the UK. And until we came over with Steel Panther um, just about four or five years ago. But uh, yeah, that was that was the last time we would ever open up for anybody in the UK. Just it was uh, it just everything exploded that quickly. Yeah, because it did like obviously you, you at that point you'd been a band for like nearly 10 years. Yeah. Well, yeah, over. Yeah, yeah, right at 10 years, you're right. Um, yeah, about, uh, well, okay, so let's think about that. That was 2002? Yeah, so eight years. Yeah, yeah so eight years. Uh, and, and honestly, what's crazy is still not on a tour bus in the United States, like still in a van, still traveling around, playing to maybe 20, 30 people. 
in some in some cities, you know. And uh, so, you know, the bit song had done really well in the UK, which is what got us that sponge tour anyway. Uh, and then, of course, just the love of of uh, of all of the media for for Girl the Bad Guys One and that album. Um, you know, it it uh, was definitely it was crazy. But yeah, it, it yeah. definitely wasn't overnight. That's for sure. It'd been been eight years since we had started. Yeah, because it like at the time it sort of it felt like you'd sort of come out of nowhere. Mm, but then yeah. there was this like, oh, actually, there's a back catalog here. There's there's sure. they, you know sometimes when you find a band and they've only got that one album, you're kind of like, oh, okay, well, I've I've sort of played this to death. What do I do now? But with yeah, you guys, because right. you had that sort of you had that head start almost. You're like, oh, okay, this is feels like a new band, but there's still plenty to get your teeth into. Yeah, we had done four albums on our own. Uh, before we did Let's Do It for Johnny. So, you know, by the time Drunk Enough to Dance was getting massive, you know, we had five other albums that people could go back and get. And this is before the digital age as well. So, you know, it became a quest for people to find them. You know, just finding the, the stuff was not that easy. And so eBay became this whole thing where Bowling for Soup stuff was going for way too much money. <laughs> and so... Um, but yeah, man, uh, that's that's uh, that's the thing, right? When people find us now, uh, which still happens, which is great. But you know, somebody, but, hey, I just started listening to you guys. Holy shit! You know, you got like twenty-one <laughs> albums, and it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah we're pretty prolific in the releasing of things. But that's so. Like, as we were saying, it's like ninety-four. So you've been a band for twenty-seven years now. Yeah, twenty-seven. We just celebrated that. Yeah, I, well, I so saw you, you, you and Chris got your twenty-five tattoos. Yeah, so yeah two all years of us. Too yeah, all of us got it too late. Yeah, but then that was, you know, Rob had joined the band by then. And so that was going to be his first Bollinger Soup tattoo. Uh, and uh, so, but COVID hit, right? So, yeah. you know, about six months into that 25th year, COVID hit. And so, um, you know, it was, uh, we just never got to do it. So I uh, went back and did that. And, uh, and so, yeah, it was, a, it was a special day. It was, it was super fun. That That's all on our, uh, if anybody wants to check that out, you can go to the Bowling Pursuit Instagram or my Instagram and see those tattoos. And uh, do you still get the same kick out of it 27 years later? Does it still, you know, do you still enjoy being in a band? Yeah, I, I being being in Bowling for Soup is my favorite thing. I mean, I, I love being a dad. I love my kids. I love my wife. I love my dogs, you know. But outside of that, you know, it's like I I don't it's, you know, I don't have to go to some job that I ha have to force myself to take pride in. You know, I'm in Bowling for Soup, you know, and it's so, and I genuinely miss them when I'm not around them. And we genuinely, you know, when we are together, it's fucking magical, you know, just uh, just us sitting in a room. Honestly, I, I, and I, I know this because people tell me, but it's just entertaining just to be there you know because something you know it's, it's we're it's just the right combination of dudes you know um and so yeah i do i you know i i really really have missed going and playing shows uh because we have not played many over the last two years uh and so the ones that we have have been really really special we got a few more coming up this year but really starting spring of next year is when we'll be really back at it again and and i'm uh, i'm really hoping that that uh, that things are open up by then and that that we can all get out there and safely enjoy it and and uh, because yeah I do I still love it I you know there's nothing like there's nothing like playing in front of you know 2500 people who are singing as loud as your amps and drums and stuff uh to a song that you made up sitting in your underpants in your kitchen huh. you know I mean there's yeah. just there's nothing it's impossible to explain you know it's amazing that and uh, like that loyalty as well as I'm sure there are people who've been with you all the way you know and yeah I know yeah. you know lots of people who you know found you like in, in the early 2000s and jumped on board and have been on board ever since like including myself you know yeah I mean you know like you 20 years I mean goodness gracious that's you know and then but and that's just it, generations, you know, I mean, yeah. there's people who were coming to see us in Texas in the 90s that now are, and I, this is crazy, but that are bringing their grandchildren to see us, you know, because they were right. bringing their, you know, they were bringing their teenage kids. Think about it, though. If you bring in your teenager to see us, 
back in the in the in the late 90s or 2000s you know that there's a good chance you've got a 10 year old grandkid now you know it's like so you know three generations of of people coming to see us and i mean that is uh that's that's that is, that was one of the first things that really sort of alerted me i don't know if that's the right word way to say it but i guess you know sort of that i caught on to like man mate you know there is something about us and what we're doing that you know parents and kids agree on and uh and it's and it and that's the thing right people are like what's the what's the connection between you and the uk audience and i'm like well uk audience really gets the energy and the humor uh, and also just because they can tell that we're just real people. And I think that American people get the same sort of stuff. Um, but it for some reason, it becomes more of like a musical thing over here. But in both places and then and, you know, and everywhere uh, we're that band that that, you know, like a dad is like, man, I don't I don't have I have zero in common with my kid. We like completely different things. And then we found Bowling for Soup. And now we're absolutely hooked. We never miss a gig. We talk about you all the time. You know, it's like the first time he ever came out of his room in 10 years and, you know, whatever, two years. And it was because your new video was coming on, you know, and we had to watch it together. And it's like, man, I was like, there's something about that, guys. Like, you know, and uh, and, and it's still like that to this day. Yeah. It's clearly, clearly special to people and resonates, you know. And I don't, I, I, you know, it's hard, it's hard to say that any music is sort of timeless, but I, I think, I know uh, you, you jokingly updated uh, Girl All the Bad Guys once yeah. re recently. Right. And, um, but I think lots of those songs still hold up and they, you know, like um, High School Never Ends and stuff. It's like, right. yeah, yeah, I can relate to that. And I'm sure teenagers today can relate to that. And, you, you yeah. know. It's, you know, that's one of those songs. I was actually just saying this on another interview, but, and I'm 50 years, I'm almost 50 years old. And uh, here I am singing a song about high school, but the message of that song is still true. And that, that the politics and just those relationships and the way that they work and the inner workings of just social uh, existence in high school is sort of just an ex uh, it's it's just everything else just sort of expands on that and becomes these other little pockets of that so it's just like it's the same thing in the workplace it's the same thing with you and your best mates it's the same thing with your neighbors it's the same thing you know here whatever it's it's like it, those those just odd intricacies and relationships and like you know why is my wife why is my wife uh, in an argument with the, my other friend's wife right now over literally nothing. Like what is happening right now? But it's the same shit, right? Yeah. It's, it's all the same. And so it, it is funny. It's like, you know, that, that phrase high school never ends. I had made a, I, I hang, hung onto that for so long already. And now that song is, you know, that song came out in 2006, seven, 2007. So, you know, uh, 15 years ago, and uh, still rings true to me. Yeah, and like I say, I think uh, I think you you talk to lots of people that that's yeah, it's still very true. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I think most people would agree. You know, I think most people find themselves in situations where they're just like, Jesus Christ, high school never ends. You know, like it's it's just that's, that, and you know, it's. I mean, I see it on the internet all the time, and I want to just like hashtag high school never ends, but you know. I, I I oftentimes can think of something a little bit more clever. It's true, uh, like I you know for the most part I sort of separated myself from lots of the people I went to school with, but uh, someone got in touch with me recently, like a friend of mine got in touch with me recently after years and years, and he started bringing up names of people that he still sees, and I was just like, oh my god, I haven't thought about these people for years. Mm. But there are still some of those same dynamics of like, oh, well, he was seen out with so-and-so's girlfriend. <laughs> it's like, it's like yeah. th this is a conversation we could have had 15 years ago. And yeah. It's still... <laughs> I'm the same way. I mean, once once we left our hometown, like we were gone for, uh, that was it. I don't really have a lot of those relationships anymore. I mean, Facebook is an interesting thing because it sort of at least puts those people into your your line of, line of sight every few months or whatever. Um, but you're very right. 
you know, you still see those and I see them interacting. I see people that I knew back then interacting and just going, oh, my God, like this is still how we're acting, you know. Um, but, you know, it's a uh, that's a it's just a comment on, you know, how our social network and, and by that, I mean, the physical social networking, um, how that all works. And it's uh, it's pretty accurate. <laughs> yeah. And uh, like with, with uh, playing shows, do you do you still get a kick out of playing the hits? Because I, I imagine like, you know, the, uh, the gigs I've been to, you, you know, certain you start certain guitar riffs and the crowd just goes crazy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so totally. Do you, do you still enjoy that or, you know, because oh, I've, yeah. I've seen a That's... few bands get a bit bitter about like, mm -hmm. oh, you only you're only here for this song or you're. Here's the thing. Hits don't grow on trees that, you know, that. The thing is, is that you've created something that makes people genuinely happy, which is what you set out to do when you put those chords and words together. The fact that people just get so weird about the fact that they have one song that's popular or more popular than others, or they, you know, hey, we're going to play our entire new album. To me, that's just such dog shit. And it's such disrespect for your fans. You know, if, if it's a thing where you're like, hey, we're going to play our whole new album, but then we're going to play you guys five or six songs that you actually like, you know, okay, maybe you do that. But, you know, don't, don't be fucking pissed if you've just alienated most of them and they're all asleep by the eighth song, you know, I mean, because yeah. that's not what they're there for. Man, there people are just like, are you sick of playing girl? The bad guys want there. There is nothing. You talk about people reacting to a riff. They hear the first three notes of that. And it is crazy. Just ah, and <laughs> the bit song is the same way. They hear that drum beat for high school never ends. You know, they hear Woo -hoo -hoo, <laughs> and it's like, what the fuck's time, Jesus? You know, it's like. How do you ever, I just gave myself chills. If I had hair on my arms, they would be standing up right now. I mean, I, there is, that's what, that's the whole reason we're there. You know, like yeah. I don't understand the arrogance of, of expecting people to be into just every fucking thing that you do. You know, that's just not, it's, it's not reality, you know? And, and you know what, hopefully you write another song that people like, you know, yeah. and if you don't, you, you know, you can play a few of those ones that are stroking your own ego. That's fine. And we do. But look, there's nine or 10 songs that if we don't play, people are going to be fucking disappointed. And so that's what we get paid for. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's about, it's the show as well. It's, you know, um, like you were saying about British people sort of appreciating the music and the vibe and the energy yeah. and stuff. And there, and there are, you know, a few American bands that I will definitely no matter when it is i'll go and see because i know it's going to be a good night out i might right. hear some new music I'll, I'll definitely hear some classics but i'll laugh and i'll dance and i'll mm -hmm. enjoy myself you know yeah is, is you know i'm sure that's what you do it for at the end of the day isn't it? for sure yeah i mean and, and for us it's about the the show our show is and i i think you know i think our fans will agree we're entertaining each other and everybody else is just getting to be a part of it. Like, yeah. like we're trying to make each other laugh. And that's the, that's the beauty of it all is this like that we're having as much fun as you are. And yeah. I think that is where in what really caught on, I think was the realness of it for us over there. And just, you know, the fact that we're, we just sort of look normal, you know, and yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, I think that that helped, but um, you know, and I, I think we we wrote some good songs as well. And, and yeah, um, luckily, you know, even when we put out new stuff, there's always a lot of support um, throughout the United Kingdom. So that's that's good for us. Hey, Mr. Record Man, what's wrong with you? Still living off your catalog from 1982. Hey, Mr. Record Man, your system can't compete. It's the new artist model. What's your what's your take on streaming? Because I know uh, lots of musicians are against it, and uh, like, you know Spotify and things. Hey, what, what's your take on that? Here's my take. Uh, you know, we've never made money on music. Um, when we were selling hundreds of thousands of albums, uh, 
was the time of Napster, uh, LimeWire and all that. People were stealing as much as they were buying. And we missed out on the, uh, the, you know, of the thing where you sell a bunch of records and make a bunch of money, um, which is fine because that's gotten us to where we are now. And here's where we are now. We're making money on, on streaming. Everybody is. Uh, and and those who aren't making the kind of money that they want to make have never been on a label where you literally get nothing. You know, you're, you, you just owe them money all the time. So I think what people have to understand and where musicians get caught up is that they, th I, I just see so many young bands, especially think, I'm going to go spend $10,000 on this album and then I'm going to put it on Spotify and I'm going to make my money back. Well, that's not how it's ever worked. It's never worked that way. Back in the day before streaming, you had to go make CDs and that was more of an investment. You had to do this. Then you had to go out there and bust your fucking ass and sell them to make that money back. So it was never just, I'm going to do this, I'm going to throw it out there, and then I should get paid for this. That's, that's, not, that's the thing, is you have to put all of it into perspective on what you're actually providing and the work that you're doing. So if you're not making enough money on streaming, then you need to get your streams up. How do you get your streams up? Build a fucking tour base. Build a following. Build, get on playlists. Bust your ass like we fucking did. So I, I'm passionate about this because... Yeah. I think bands are fucking lazy now. I think they think that, you know, okay, well, you know, there's like in, in, in America, for example, you know, you, we were talking just a minute ago about how we had already been together eight years before we had a hit. Yeah. Well, look back on our stories of those eight years. And that is us in a van, literally driving from city to city, sometimes not even having a show, just trying to find one going into bars going, hey, do you have a band tonight? No, you want one? Like, let us play. Let us get in front of people every single day, every single day, drive and drive and drive and drive and drive and drive. So if you're not doing that, if you're not putting that much work into it, you have no reason to complain about how much money you're getting paid on streams. And that's the way I feel about it. Uh, I yeah. think that, that that's an outlet that you can build upon, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't and never has been. Selling music has never been the main source of income for bands ever. It never has been. It's merch, touring, shows, merch, 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 touring shows, merch, touring shows. That's it. That's how yeah. you make money. So you, just be happy you're getting fucking something. That's what I'm saying. It's like you see lots of musicians today where it, it feels like they're selling you merch to sell you an album. So it's like, right. I'll buy, buy this T-shirt and we'll throw in a digital copy of the album. Buy a, buy a hoodie and we'll throw it, you know. Right, exactly. Look, I, here's what I tell bands all the time. So I hope a lot of young bands listen to this. And don't think I'm an asshole because I'm not. I, I just am one of the only people that are just fucking be honest with you about shit. You should just, you should make CDs and give them away. They're fucking cheap. Nobody has a CD player anymore. So... Trying to get people to pay for it is crazy, but those that do just give it out, but put something in their hand so yeah. that they, that way that they feel like they have to go, oh, well, I should go, let me go listen to this on spot. I don't own a CD player. Nobody does. So why don't I fucking go get this on Spotify, right? Like I'll go listen to this because they took the time to do that. But especially if they're buying a piece of merch, if they're paying 25 pounds for a t-shirt, 20 pounds for a t-shirt or whatever, hand them a CD, put it in their hand. You know, yeah. and just go, hey, even if you don't have a CD player, go stream this, you know, but you're right. It's a that's that's the business card these days, because um, quite frankly, it's already on the Internet. Right. So it's it's hard to expect somebody to buy a CD unless um, you're a band that can autograph them all and that means something yeah. or you're a band that can have some sort of special packaging or something in the cd that they can only have and they are they're going to want that at that point okay sell them this sell them that music but quite frankly you're selling you know you why buy the cow when you can get the milk for free right like yeah that used to be about chicks now it's about songs <laughs> i'm passionate about this whole streaming thing just because again ask a band that was around 15 years ago, how much money they ever made selling music. 
So if it's, you know, whatever it is, it's not how the, it, it didn't pay the rent. Yeah. People weren't going around selling enough CDs or getting enough airplay or whatever. I'm talking, and I'm not talking about Taylor Swift. I'm not talking about Bon Jovi. I'm talking yeah. about just bands, right? Normal fucking bands. The ones complaining, right? The ones saying, I've got a hundred thousand streams and I got a check for, you know, $40 or whatever. I don't know what the math is. Right. Yeah. But it's yeah. like, fuck, I don't know. I mean, people stole our song, you know, 140 million times and I didn't get shit. So I don't know. I say buy, buy some beer with that 40 bucks and have a great night out, you know? Yeah. And then, then go play some fucking shows and build a fan base. Yeah. Or, or like put $40 worth of uh, petrol or gas in your van and go and do some shows. Here, in, here in fact, lies what you really should do. Yeah. Put 40 bucks into that social media advertising. Do a Google ad. Do a Facebook ad. Do an Instagram promotion. Buy something that you can all sign and that everybody would want and give it away for followers. You know what I mean? Reinvest yeah. in yourself. Because that's why when you ask how much money were you guys making on CDs back in the day? It was all going in the gas tank or to buy stickers to give away or to put up and all of this. Like it, it's all just reinvesting, right? Nothing has changed. You know, it's, it's not like things are just different. You know, you can look at the, the, and sure. Look, do I wish that we got paid more for um, streaming services? Sure. But do I want you to boycott them? Fuck no. Put me in a playlist, man. Fucking spin that shit all the time. Just keep going. Because, look, I, I, it's it's more than we ever made before. I, I know I already said that. But, yeah. you know, it's like when you get a check for something that, you you know, you used to just, it just used to just exist in the world. And you were out there, like, fucking playing these songs. Please buy T-shirts so that we can afford to get to the next town. You know? Yeah. <laughs> now it's like, hey, you know what? Everybody can fucking pay their rent this month you know it's nice like i say i i, I felt like you know different people feel different ways about mm. it and it's nice to hear some people say positive things because you just hear so much negative things about streaming that it's, it's yeah. nice to hear a different perspective you know dude and as a fan yeah how is it not the greatest thing in the world like holy shit frank turner and the descendants both have a new album out today I'm going to fucking make a playlist with both of those albums and then just go drive around and waste gas, you know, like I, let's fucking go, you know? Yeah. And I, and, and that's it. Like it, you're just done. And then what is it? Nine, $12 a month that I, that I'm out for that. Jesus Christ. Any song I ever want to hear, you know? And, yeah. and I have them all, by the way, I'm not partial to any, I got, you know, again, I, I have them all because different, different kids like different ones. You know, I have three kids and a wife and certain people like this thing. And this, so I just, I got Amazon, Pandora, Apple music, Spotify, you know, whatever. But, um, so, you know, people are like, which one? I don't care. Just fucking pick one and yeah. stream the shit out of us. We're thinking about calling the al the new album, uh, stream the shit out of this album, Fuckface. And I'm not kidding. Yeah. I like it. You know, it's like there's you know back in the day we'd have like a uh, system of a day and we'd steal this album. It's like the sure. mod <laughs> modern equivalent of it. <laughs> you know, or you have the the visionary who was MC Lars who would download this song, which I appeared on and sang, which is not that far off as now. Do rec he did say records companies wouldn't exist in 10 years, and they don't as they did then. They do exist, but they've had to change their business model too. Yeah. You know, they're, 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 they're wanting streams just as bad as we are instead of fighting it now, you know, that's, that's there. Everybody's that's where everybody's doing their shit. Right. So, um, but yeah, it's uh download. This song it was way ahead of its time, you know, and, and I think he knows that too, you know, that he was fucking telling people to steal his shit back when <laughs> other people were paying for it. And I had him on the label for a while on crappy records and, you know, when you're trying to re, <laughs> when you're trying to get your investment back and he's just fucking giving away high hard drives with all of his shit on there. It was frustrating, but I love that kid, man. He's uh, that he's smart, smart dude. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, then uh, you've, uh, you've been working on a country album during lockdown. Yeah. yeah. So, tell me a bit more about that, man. I'm, I'm very intrigued. 
Well, I, you know, I grew up in Wichita Falls, Texas. Country's been a part of my life forever and ever. I mean, I will admit that I, you know, once I found punk rock back in the, you know, uh, metal, you know, in the eighties and then punk rock and, you know, I mean, country was just sort of like the side I'd listen to it every once in a while. I liked certain songs, but, you know, I really got into over the last 10 years into a lot more like Texas country and, and uh, not necessarily pop country, not like Nashville, like, like super polished, but the uh, country. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I've always thought, man, we should do a record called Bollinger Soup Goes Country. And, you know, but I've also, also always wanted to do something on my own um, and not to get away from those guys, just to do something in addition, because I'm not slowing down Bollinger Soup. Like, we just fucking finished a new record, too. Yeah. So <laughs> you know, I was quite busy during uh, during during the lockdown. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, man, I I went. Um, I just decided I just said, fuck it. I'm going to do it. You know, I'm going to I'm just going to. And I'm invest my own money and um, try to do it as economically as I can. And uh, so I, I got with my friend, Zach Malloy, who uh, is in a band called the Nixons, who had a big hit back in the nineties. And, uh, but he's been a songwriter for the last 20 years um, and has written songs for like Carrie Underwood and Blake Shelton, but also rock bands like uh, Skillet and uh, Hailstorm and, Daughtry and and you know tons and tons of, of bands great writer great friend great producer and I was just like let's just do this country record together so we wrote it together and he produced it we hired all the musicians uh who recorded 12 songs in one day wow <laughs> this is fucking crazy <laughs> but that's the way it works you know and that kind of music they just chart it out and just sit there and play awesome shit um, and you know, I got guests on there. I got Stefan Egerton, Egerton from the, uh, from the descendants. I got uncle cracker. I got Frank Turner, uh, Cody Canada, who's a big Texas country guy. And, um, you know, I, uh, I managed to put this thing together. So I'm trying to get it out by the end of the year. In fact, I just, just before I sort of talking to you, I sent my wife, uh, a photo or the a JPEG of the cover that I think it's going to be. And, uh, she was like, I really like it. So I'm getting close, man. But, okay. you know, I, 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 I want to play music. I want to create stuff. And it's like, you know, I don't know what pace Bowling for Soup will keep going, but I know what pace I want to keep going. And uh, I, I don't think we're going to slow down per se, but I don't think we're going to really speed back up, you know? Yeah. Um, and I don't mean COVID. I mean, we're going to get back to the point where we were, you know, two years ago, where we're touring, you know, a couple of months a year over the, you know, over the course of the year and release music or whatever. And then, but then I want to, you know, I, and I, of course I got my podcast and that shit, but I want to, you know, I, I want to make sure that I'm just, that I've got enough outlets to create. And, you know, I did a band with Kelly from the Dolly Rots and uh, that's fun. I want to make sure that we can do more stuff. And uh, you know, I uh, it's, it's awesome too, man. I think you really, I think people are going to love it. And uh, then you said you, you're getting back on the road properly next year and you come in, yeah. come into the UK. Yep. And uh, ori originally it was just sort of uh, coastal seaside towns, wasn't it? But yeah. you have added a few more. But you're touring next year with Lit. Uh, hey, are you excited about that? Excited coming back to the UK? Yeah, I mean, so the thing is, is that we, you know, we had been, we were there in February of uh, last year. Yeah. And COVID was happening right as we were leaving uh, and we got home. And so that tour was supposed to be like a Christmas tour, but we went ahead and scheduled it for May. We thought obviously the pandemic will be over, but you know, the markets were already booked because you, if we come twice in a year, we try to do what it's called B markets. You do all the major cities, then you do what's called B markets. Well, we've never done like a coastal town thought, okay, we'll do surf the UK. Uh, but then that got pushed a year. So now it's super weird because it's like, we have it, we will have not been there for two years and we're going to like, you know, all these little coastal towns. And then, you know, I think London and Glasgow and I think maybe Birmingham, maybe. Birmingham, I, I don't, yeah. It, yeah, it's it's not it's not the normal place that we usually play. Uh, but I'm excited about it, man. I mean, you know, we've known the lit guys for a long, long time. I think that they're they're just such a rocking band. And then, of course, the Dolly Rots, who are like family to us, as I mentioned before, Kelly and I even have our own band and. We vacation, you know, our, our families vacation together and our, our sons are best friends. So, you know, that's like having family on the road. So, you know, I'm, I'm super excited about it. Um, 
you know, yeah, next April is when it is surf yeah. the UK. So we changed it to crowd surf the UK. Um, and uh, so, you know, but uh, yeah, I'm hoping that, that, uh, you know, maybe I can get the acoustic tour in before that, just kind of get over there and, and sort of start to get my chops back. But Bowling for Soup's doing a few shows uh, later this month in the Northeast here in the U.S. and then uh, a home show in October, a couple of little random things here and there. And then, yeah, I mean, pretty light first part of next year. Rob, Rob and his new wife are going to have a baby. So uh, we'll be taking a little time off for that. And uh, so I'm actually hoping that I can use that. Um, that'll be getting ready for the new record. So the new record should drop in April as well. Oh, okay. Um, and I'm hoping that I could use that time to get ahead on on writing more stuff or or doing more covers and you know so we, we keep ourselves busy doing the covers that's another thing that i should say about streaming should you ask me about this yeah, yeah uh one of the best things about streaming is used to when you wanted to do a cover song if you sold it you had to figure out how, how to pay the rights the mechanical royalties and just the royalty royalties and all the publishing and all that stuff royal pain in the ass now, if you release a cover on YouTube, Spotify, all that shit, as long as you don't go and sell it, you can do it anything you want. Yeah. So you can put out a covers album tomorrow and not pay any royalties as long as you don't sell it. But here's the beauty of it. You still get that streaming revenue and that artist gets paid their part of the streaming revenue for the writing of the song. <laughs> and here's the best part. That company, Spotify or YouTube or Pandora or whoever, does all the accounting and payment for you for free. So, you know, that's I, I tell everybody, like, how do we build it? Dude, just fucking put a cover out every month, like do a badass cover song, put it out as a single and keep and just keep doing it. Go, 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 go. You know, just keep keep that content going. And then one of the one of them's going to catch on, you know, and, and yeah. you're see your numbers go. Exactly, yeah. And, you know, that a lot of uh, pop punk is sort of built on covers, you know. As, uh, me, and my, me and my brother took my dad, um, I think it was 2019, we, we took him to see a Real Big Fish. He'd never, oh, yeah. ne never seen a Real Big Fish show before. And he was like, well, you, you've taken us to loads of gigs. Let, let us take you to, you know, one of our gigs. And uh, we took it to see Real Big Fish. And we're like, have you listened to any of the songs beforehand? And he was like, I've listened to Brown Eyed Girl. I've listened. He just listened to all the covers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, like, what is the other one? Uh, Take On Me. Yeah. Another Day in Paradise. Yeah. yeah that's awesome. <laughs> that's like, yeah. Okay. So you've, yeah, you've just listened to them doing other people's. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Man, they did this bit on, uh, so we're obviously very close with those guys. We toured together many times and, uh, they did this bit on the Warp Cruise where they were talking about how they they did this cover song and that and the only real hit they ever had was in the 90s. And they did a 20 minute bit. I'm not joking of just them playing like a verse and a chorus of different 90s songs that weren't theirs. Yeah. And it got it went so long that it did that thing where it's funny at first and then it gets uncomfortably odd and then it's just the fucking funniest thing you've ever heard in your life yeah and i mean it was and it was just it was it was one of the best bits i've ever seen a a, a band like that do i and i still think about it to this day just like and then they finally get to their one hit you know that they had back then the sell out you know which was yeah. a big hit for them in the in the 90s thank you ever so much for talking to me jared i really appreciate yeah. your time that was fun. I'm sorry I didn't. Uh, I'm sorry. I, was, I, was, I, I apologize to everybody for getting on such a rant about streaming, but uh, I don't know, man. You just see everybody com complaining about it, and I'm just like, man, I, I, I just don't feel like people know where it was years ago, you know. But what are you going to do? You can't convince everybody that you're a genius. And uh, make make sure you go and see uh, Jarrett in next April here in the UK and. If you, you know, if we can squeeze a solo tour in there in the meantime, definitely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And also bowlingforsoup.com, obviously, for all of your tour dates all the time. But, you know, I also do two podcasts or three podcasts, actually. Uh, and I'm all over social media and I've got three bands and uh, and then the new country thing. So that's all insane. I get it. So just go to jarrettreddick.com 
and uh, all your links to everything are there or just follow me anywhere at jaret2113 awesome yeah i fully recommend following on instagram i really enjoy your instagram thank you man i appreciate that eight o'clock monday night and i'm on tinder i swipe right on a girl a little cooler than me her name is ava she's got a choker and a lip kit she likes young blood but i'm not quite sure who that is and when she walks all the wind blows and the angels sing but she doesn't you have to polish yourself up